Hi everyone. Today I have a really special guest in the podcast. This is Martin Gillespie from now. I never checked how to pronounce this. Warunga, 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 Sydney, New South Wales. <laughs> um, so he's from Sydney, and he's got a Scottish accent. Just in case you missed that. So Martin is a board member at the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. That's a really big mouthful. But what he really is, is a holistic coach with a focus on well-being. And today we're going to talk about why Martin ditched his corporate blazer to focus on working with other men and women, but men, to develop resilience, wellness and empathy. So Martin and I had a fantastic chat last week, but I never pushed the record button. <laughs> so we're back having another go today. Hey, Martin, thanks so much for coming. Oh, look, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. And, um, you know, for my fellow Celts in New Zealand, it's fantastic to speak in my own language that people will understand me. So <laughs> it's, great to be it's great to be here. Um, and, it, you know, it's just fantastic to connect with like-minded people, especially as we've now moved out of 2020 into a new world. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Well, we talked about a lot of stuff last week, but let's start off. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Because you've got a pretty good backstory. Um, yeah, sure. And you've so been doing some really amazing, amazing work. So oh, look, th th thank you for the compliment. So... It was a few years ago I, I realized that um, I was helping a lot of people, but not, not conscious of it, if that makes sense. And I was working in the corporate world, and a few years ago I, I presented at the Are You OK Day, which is in September of every year, and I spoke about what it's like to be a man in today's society and what masculinity is, but most importantly, Asking for help should not be a sign of weakness, no matter what sex we are. And from that, I had about three dozen people come up to me and started talking about, you know, can you help me here? Can you help me there? So I realized that my corporate career was no more. This was a vacation for me. And if I take a step back, my, you know, you've, you've led the way into my background. So um, 10 years ago, I was, I was married, I had two young kids here in Sydney, and um, then the wheels started falling off emotionally. My mum passed away at the age of 68 in Scotland, which is extremely young. Um, she died of heart disease. And then the following year, we found out that my parents who had been married 43 years, that my father had had a mistress for 35 of those years. And I actually have another brother in Scotland. So oh, I thought I was one of five kids, but I'm actually <laughs> one of six. So the mistress, believe it or not, got worse. The mistress moved into the family house after mum's passing. So we were all quite kind of amazed at how, you know, being with somebody for so long and lo and behold, you get a new partner so quickly. And then we put two and two together. My sisters put two and two together. And then um, April 2012, my young sister at the age of 37 um, fought a fantastic battle for, of breast cancer, but she lost her life. She was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer. And for those who don't know, there's, there's so many different variations of cancer as, a, as an illness, but inflammatory breast cancer, instead of it being a lump on your breast, it was actually through the layers of skin. So extremely oh, wow. difficult to try and detect. And it gone into a lymph nodes and gone into other organs. So as soon as it starts spreading, it's extremely difficult to control. And being so young as well was, was quite horrendous. The beautiful thing was that Denise, my sister, was a nurse. So she knew exactly the kind of care that she was getting, the, the doctors treating her and the nursing staff she trained with, so they were mates. So she knew wholeheartedly what was happening. So unfortunately, she lost her life in April 2012. In, this, in six weeks after Denise's passing, 
my father was on a six foot wall. So what, 180 meters around his house. And similar to the shirt I'm wearing just now, I had a pocket in the top here. And he had a pair of garden secateurs pointing like that. And as he went to over, over stretch, he fell and the secateurs in his pocket opened up as he fell and pierced him in the heart and he bled to death. Then six months after that, my six year marriage I, I'm collapsed. And then six weeks after that, I was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so to put it into perspective, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, again, there are over 70 different variations of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there's Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Both are blood cancers, essentially. And I didn't know much about them when I was diagnosed. So stage one would have just been your lymph nodes. And for me, it was just around your neck. And if you've got kids, you generally check swollen glands or even yourself around your neck is a, is a you know, your, your tonsils swell up if you've got tonsils, if you've got inflammation. So I had lumps. So stage one would have just been lumps above your neck, stage two above your diaphragm, stage three all over your body, stage four all over your body and in vital organs. I had it all over my body and in my bone marrow. So every white blood cell that was produced had cancer. So I was in a pretty tough space. And when after doing a, a round of tests to find out what it was, when I went into my hematologist's office, the first thing he's told me was that it was stage four and I burst into, I burst into tears. And he said, Martin, you're okay. You're young enough. I was 41 at the time. And you're seeing a psychologist tomorrow. And I thought, I'm Scottish. Why the hell do I need to talk to somebody? I can talk for Scotland, but I didn't understand really the importance of professional help mm. and professional guidance to get me through this. And I've been asked many times what has been the the key that's got me through thriving now after cancer, a variety of things. One, self-belief. Two, I've got two young kids. Well, they're now teenage daughters. And three, getting the right emotional support. The drugs were one thing. The drugs were incredible. And I've had over half a million dollars worth of drugs. And thankfully, I'm, a, I'm Australian. Obviously, you can tell with my accent. But the drugs did push me around a little bit, and I'll go into that in, uh, later during the conversation. But getting the right help was the thing that got me through. And from that was a catalyst to get more help and more help. And over the years, and even now I have a coach, I reach out to people because I've realized that when you collaborate with people and when you share things, you actually increases your vibration hugely mm -hmm. and if you try and keep things in especially as blokes we keep it in and we hit our 30s and 40s and lo and behold we have the the infamous beer belly we might look really thin but we have so much anxiety and visceral fat around our gut and then we do the stupid thing a lot of men do the stupid thing that say i'll go out for a run and then two weeks later, they're in hospital, or even worse, they fall down dead. Mm -hmm. We think we're invincible as men. And that really took me the catalyst of many things to actually look at. There is a lack of support for men, really in that sort of age group between 30 and 60, which coincidentally is globally the highest suicide rate in the world. Wow. But we don't talk about it. Mm. Or that, did I say it, and, and I never want to be racist, but it's a white Anglo-Saxon problem. We don't want to address it because it doesn't happen to us directly, if that makes sense. Mm. The more we talk about wellness and a couple of things that we can do in our control, the more we bring it to the top table, the better we are mentally, physically, and emotionally. Yeah, interesting. I've got... I've got three sons and a daughter and it's quite interesting how different they all are about 
you know, talking and sharing and the boys have their own way of doing it. But it's not the same as us women do. We, we kind of sit down and we're very good at empathising with each other and um, support, you know, being supportive and acknowledging each other, whereas the boys seem to be a bit more, you know, give them a slap on the shoulder and tell them to get a shit together. You well, know? It, it's funny, you know, one of, one of the beautiful things that you guys have in New Zealand is the pleasure and love of, of rugby. Like being brought up in Scotland, soccer or football, but it's also more than that. It creates a community of, of involvement. However, it also does mask a lot of things that happen to men that we don't talk about. We might stand around a barbecue and we might say, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. We don't go deep enough as men to yeah. talk about it because we feel uncomfortable. Mm. However, if you flip it, and lo and behold, someone crashed into your car, your motor vehicle. Guess what? That would be in the, the car mechanics the following day. But what about this mechanical thing called your body? Mm. We don't look after it well enough. Mm. And do you think there's some sort of, like a bit of fear or something and I've experienced this as a woman as well, especially if you appear to have all your shit together, so to speak. And then if you um, express some vulnerability or some mental health stuff that's going on to people that are close to you, it's like they pull back and they don't really want to know. And... And so rather than get the support that you need, you actually feel like you're more isolated and you feel like you should never have mentioned it in the first place because you just need to keep that perception of, you know, you're in control, you've got your life together, um, nothing wrong with me. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that the, 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 the biggest awareness is, you know, a fantastic phrase called alienation. And I guess that that's one of the faces of modern masculinity, that we hide behind it uh, as men and as women at times as well. We're very good at making excuses not to attend a social event or um, make last minute decisions that you won't go to dinner with a, with a group of friends. Mm -hmm. Because we feel ashamed if we were to turn around and I guess... It's a, it's a generational thing as well. If we were to turn around to our friends and say, you know what, I don't feel mentally strong today. Mm. The recipient wouldn't know what to do because mm. we're not, the education system we have, whether it be streetwise, university, school, whatever, we, we don't have that equipment because we're preset with our judgments mm. on, if you say mental health or your mental yeah yeah well if you just say you know what i'm just not feeling it today um i love you but i need a bit of space and i think that these are the things and to share with you one of the things that i did last year so i set up my company last year and it's called gem wellness warriors and the gem stands for growth empathy and mindset yeah. right that was the three key things that came to me um it's also my initials backwards, Gillespie Edward Martin. Oh, oh that's cool. It was yeah. set in the universe that I was to do this. But Definitely. it's taking... One of the key things as a, as a man, and I keep focusing as a man, and I don't want to, be, I don't want to have the gender conversation, but as a man, we, we're built to try and fix things. The masculinity energy is about fixing. What happens if you're the recipient that needs to be fixed or requires to be fixed? We sometimes don't have that emotional vocabulary. And to show that vulnerability, you know, if you were in a relationship and if you turn to your significant other and say, I need half an hour of my time, just for me, don't even say anything, just give me half an hour. The strength of your relationship will get stronger. But men, we sometimes lose faith in our own self because we, we actually have a lot of insecurities. 
And one of the things that I set up last year, and I initially set it up as a, as a bit of a pilot to see how things were going. As, as we all know, last year was a wonderful year. <laughs> you know, it's quite ironic, you know, 2020 is synonymous for having perfect vision. Well, I don't know if you would put last year as a perfect visionary year, but there's been some really good things that have happened out of it. So in my local community, which was an incredible, I went old school, printed off posters, banners, went around the coffee shops, the butchers, the um, bookshop and said, look, I'm starting a men's circle, connecting men to come and provide a safe space for men to talk. The biggest thing that stood out to me was my local butcher. Now, my local butcher looks as if he was a butcher the moment he was conceived. <laughs> a big beard, <laughs> tattoos, earring, and there's nothing wrong with an earring, but earring, a um, big, big man. And I gave him the post and I explained to him what I'm doing. And he just went, mate, this is so needed. And with pride, put it on his window. And I went in there the next day and he was talking to customers going, you need to get your, your partner to this event. So it was over a 12 week period and I ran it in a very rustic scout hall. So I don't know if you recall, and hopefully your listeners will recall being at school and you just have those bench seating that you have. Yeah, yeah. Floor. So I kind of looked around going, I just want it to be basic. The more basic, the more equalizing it will be. And over that period, I had 35 glorious men come through. And the, the most amount that I had was six people in front, six men in front of me at the one time. And to be honest, you know, you have faith in your own ability. There were two occasions that nobody turned up, but I didn't care if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it was on a Tuesday and Thursday at lunchtime. And every week I facilitated a conversation, a topic of conversation. So it would be things like stress, which was the obvious one. Then I brought up the conversation about alcohol, because as we know, last year there was quite a spike in alcohol. Mm. And I'm not saying alcohol is wrong, but just controlling the consumption of it when we're under stress is an equally important aspect to at least have that conversation. So I would have, I would bring this conversation and then let the men just talk for about 40 minutes. And then I would put them into meditation, but I wouldn't call it meditation because one thing I did learn early on in the piece and when I was doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching I have a perception because I meditate and I, I know that you do as well, but when you start doing it, you can easily go from five minutes to 20 minutes to an hour. But when you, you forget, when you start off, this is something so new. So I did three to five minutes. That was it of the main. And then lo and behold, as the weeks progress, Susan, that's what one of the key things that the men were looking forward to. So they didn't want to finish until they had their meditation. Mm, and right. one of the beautiful men that came, man in his sort of late thirties, three year old and a newborn baby during the time. Now, one of the things that we did speak about was the importance of good sleep hygiene. If you recall when you have, when you had your children and you're young, and they're young if you said to a new parent, get eight hours sleep a night, you'll be fine. You'll be in the divorce courts before you know it, right? So what can you do to help lower that stress, cortisol feeling that people have? Meditate three, four times a day, right? Even for five minutes. And you can teach your partner and you can actually do it at different times. It doesn't have to be five o'clock in the morning, I'll do it, six o'clock at night choose the time that feels right for you. And that was the message I was giving to the men. And it was fantastic. And I said, look, I'm, I'm doing it up until Christmas. And the one key thing for me was the amount of learning that I got. I also became quite uncomfortable with some of the conversations. 
I'll give an example. Providing that safe space for men, I had two South African men. And one of the topics that I brought to the table was what happened to that 12-year-old boy of that freedom? And I know this sounds like an extra from Braveheart when I say freedom, <laughs> but that freedom that we didn't have a mobile phone, we most likely didn't have a watch on our wrist, we certainly did not wear a helmet on our bikes. Mm, mm. What joy happened? And I didn't know this. I've been brought up in the UK. I was brought up in a certain way as well. And but the South African men that opened up, they were brought up in farms in South Africa. And they learned from a young age how to sh hold a gun and shoot small animals. I've never held a gun. So I had to put my uncomfortable pants on but watch the joy and feel the emotion of the men talking about how that lit their hearts up. But for me, I struggled a few weeks just getting my head into their space. Mm, interesting. But it was a great learning for me as well to mm. go, you have, in order to do what we do, we also have to feel uncomfortable. Mm. And it's accepting that uncomfortableness. But the most important thing with the men's circle was providing a safe space of trust that men could talk. And the fundamental thing that came out, even if, even though most of them are in relationships, committed relationships, was loneliness came out. Is what is probably the key factor that they felt that they weren't connected with other men they couldn't talk they didn't feel that they could talk about their emotions a little bit of anger if, if you want to call it that as well Susan in terms of why didn't we learn this stuff when we were a kid to talk about our emotions why didn't we learn from a young age at school and then somebody said why didn't we learn basics at school like how to run a household budget for god's sake who yeah. gives a monkeys about E equals MC squared yeah. when I need to work out how many hours of work do I need to work to pay my bills, mm -hmm. right? So some of the simplicity things came out and it's like, wow. So my goal is I will run Men's Circle later this year, but I will do it at night time. My circle was Tuesdays and Thursdays at lunchtime because during the time that I ran it, was during lockdown and men, men couldn't go to work. Well, sorry, they could go uh, to work, but working was from home. They couldn't yeah. go to the office. Yeah. So it was touching into that and really grateful that got that expo exposure. But now that here in Sydney, there is a bit more of a normality, a hybrid that almost three days a week, you're in the office, two days a week at home. I want to tap into using the energy of doing a men's circle at night time, but again, no alcohol involved and having a venue that is far away from the need or the desire that alcohol would be brought into it because I don't want that toxicity, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I want people to talk from the truth, not from behind a glass of beer, if that makes sense. And did, they, did the men ever talk about changes in their relationships after yeah so after the um, session hopefully hopefully i can get away with this actually so one of the topics i brought up and i had a list of them and um it's funny as i said i would do them on tuesdays and thursdays and pre to prepare myself i would go for a run those mornings so i brought the topic of intimacy to the table Right, and I see your smile, right? <laughs> Every man went external. Oh, if my wife or partner wore sexy underwear, <laughs> right? And then this one guy, beautiful, beautiful man said, does that mean I can go and play with myself in the corner? And it broke the ice, <laughs> right? <laughs> so again, what was a beautiful thing there was the laughter that we all had. Yes, we felt like teenagers again, but it connected the, the men or the boys to talk into a different level. Mm. The, the other big fear, if you want to call it, again, I mentioned about the telephone and connectivity is social media. 
the you know we were all fathers in the men's circle and our fear of the immediacy of social media and i know you and i've had this conversation but i'm so glad social media wasn't around when i was 16 yeah. or 18. Mm. i'm proud of the stupidity i got myself into right it's made the person i am but social media is something that has just capitalized in the last 10 15 years to a snowball that there are no rules but the the biggest thing that people forget is you're always in complete control with what you put on what someone else might say you're in no control but what you put there either your response or your content you're in control of and again the men spoke a lot of shame trying to keep up with the joneses the pressures that they felt and a remarkable thing that, again, it was new to me was two of the men, three of the men, sorry, were stay-at-home dads, mm. which was quite interesting to, so they were, again, if you look at it, the dynamics, they had a, a beautiful relationship with their respective others, but realized that the, the female was the main breadwinner and the male stayed at home and did all of that. So it was really enlightening to hear how they coped however on the flip side of it and i guess that this is a, a commonality here's this man and i guess women are the same in their mid 50s or younger kids have left school and they're feeling a little bit lost mm. what mm. what do they do and it, it, again it's both sexes here um but it was really interesting to hear the men talk about i don't know what i'm going to do now my life was my boys or my life was my kids. Mm, mm. Um, and actually one initiative that um, here in New South Wales are, they're rolling out, which I'm, I'm fully supportive of and I think is a great initiative. They have emotional support for the first two years for new dads. So when you, when you remember when you're pregnant, there's a lot of support for women throughout the medical mm. profession, but there's very little for guys. And a lot of there's there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's where there's a breakdown in communication between the male and female in a in a in a relationship because a guy feels not part of that that baby's life. Mm -hmm. So New South Wales Health are rolling out a pilot scheme and hopefully they'll get the funding on it for emotional support for men for the first two years of that child's life, which yeah, is a great mm -hmm. way forward. But mm -hmm. again, and um, you mentioned at the start of this, I'm a board director of a medical college. It's also getting the medical profession up to speed with some of these initiatives that are on their backyard as well. Yeah, and making sure that you get, they made the most of. Yeah, and but I mean, a lot of people, you know, one of the Achilles heel at, heels I have about the medical profession is that to become a doctor in New Zealand, Australia, the UK, it's a wonderful, wonderful vocation. You spend six years at university. You spend less than 10 hours on nutrition. That's not even a rounding error on the cost of the tuition fees, for God's sake. Mm. Yeah, mm. there are so many people that will go to the doctor as their first port of call and one, I guess another key thing, doctors are human beings before they become doctors. They have mm. burnout, stress, families, mm. commitments. When a general practitioner opens that door, they also have to have that mask on in order to mm. serve the public. And that can be extremely difficult. Mm. Um, they do have access, I didn't know this, that in the medical profession in Australia and the legal profession are the two highest drug abusing and alcoholism industries in Australia and in New Zealand. Yeah, I have heard that. Um, and that doctors are very high, high rates of alcoholism and drug abuse. Uh, they have, well, especially doctors have access to so many drugs. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
and I'm not saying they should know better, I mean, to share with you one, one big learning I've had over the years, and this goes back to my, my love for nutrition, if you want to call it that, goes back to when I was a teenager. And I was always really interested in when you go to a hotel and you see the door that says private or staff only <laughs> or, you know, employees only. I was always interested, what happens at the back end of a hotel that makes things work? How do you get from this raw ingredient to this masterpiece on a plate? So I studied hotel management with the focus of learning about food and nutrition and the importance of, believe it or not, I studied in probably the coldest place in the universe. Well, actually, some places in New Zealand are bloody cold in winter. But I studied in Aberdeen and I was really interested to know when boys and girls or men and women go out onto the oil rigs in the middle of the North Sea, you can't smoke and you can't take drugs and you can't take alcohol. What food do you feed people to get the right productivity out of them? And they're dealing in highly dangerous, flammable conditions. I mean, I've got a mate and his job, believe it or not, is to clean the fuel out of helicopters when they land on oil rigs. Wow. Thinks most of the time. Right? But he's got to be on point because if he doesn't clean that fuel tank and something happens, he's responsible. He's part of that responsibility mm. of a dozen people on that helicopter. Mm. However, this was in the early 90s. And unless you, you still had that really unless you were a doctor or a scientist, there was no career path. And my path was chosen to do other things. But I also, I always had a love for it and working out, okay, so if you give them high protein, they're not going to have cravings in the afternoon. And this was back in the early 90s. You can, uh -huh. Wow, that's not rocket science. But again, we become programmed with our thinking, the, the European diet or the standard Australian diet. And if you take the first three letters of the standard Australian diet, it's sad. Mm. How sad is that? It's very reflective of um, the standard American diet. And then you, you start tapping in. I've been here for 21 years in Australia. You tap into, you go and see a doctor or a nutritionist and they'll say, follow the Mediterranean diet. Well, I don't live in the Mediterranean. And you've got to put other things in mind. If you lived in Malta, right in the heart of the Mediterranean Sea, you're going to have different weather conditions, different environmental factors than what we have here in Australia or New Zealand. Yes, you're going to have beautiful sunshine. But the one key thing that I think that we are quite ignorant about, if that makes sense, there are more seasonalities in us in Europe than they are here. Clear, distinctive seasonalities and seasonalities mm. in foods. Now we're lucky in Australia and I know in New Zealand, you can get certain foods 12 months of the year. Well, I'm sorry, but strawberries don't grow in Australia and New Zealand 12 months of the year. Right? No. And a lot and, of and a proportion of our foods don't grow here 12 months of the year. Not know? at all. And you know, it takes us very brief, very collectively on to the way that so when I was ill and one of the you know, I'm reaching out getting help. It was that, you know, you must eat plenty of vegetables, etc. I had a thing called peripheral neuropathy, and for those who are not medical. That basically is having pins and needles in your fingers for six months. I could not hold a knife. I struggled holding cutlery eating because my nervous damage, there was, there was a lot of nerve damage to the ends of my fingers. So chopping things were extremely difficult. So I bought a blender. And again, I was in that phase where I must eat vegetables. And again, mm -hmm. the stoic male eagle getting in front of me, I would make up juices in a blender and they tasted foul. But you would just take them because you would, you were pick headed enough yeah. to make them. However, 
the more I researched it, I'm going, well, wait a minute. Vegetables, especially in this country, can be in certain supermarkets a year or two years old. Yet they'll say that they're fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. What damage is that doing to your gut? So I, I started, when I became a bit more alert, I, I followed my passion again and studied, started to study nutritional environmental medicine. And I got involved with ACNAM, Australian College, Australasian College of Nutritional Environmental Medicine. And they have a, they have a, a, a sort of, it's almost like a postgraduate um, for medical practitioners, postgraduate pathway. And I started studying it. And it was a four day residential course at one of the universities here. And I it was about 40 of us in the course. I was the only non medic there. And on the second or third morning, I'm traveling on the bus, on the train there. The tears are rolling down my face and I'm going, I've got two hours on gut microbiome, two hours on women's health. What the bloody hell am I doing? Right. And lo and behold, you had a, an exam at the end of it and I passed the exam much to the administrator's surprise <laughs> and they said how did you pass this? well I studied it and I really enjoyed <laughs> it right and it was funny on this it was a Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday and on the Saturday night there were drinks and before we, we broke for drinks there was you know around the room oh I'm a GP in Perth I'm one in Adelaide I'm a nutritionist I'm this <laughs> And they're all kind of looking at me. You know that bit where you kind of mm -mm. focus is on you and you think, do I smell, you know? So <laughs> looking under, smelling under your armpits. And the girl next to me, she knew I wasn't a doctor. And she's going, go and tell them. I said, oh, look, I'm a GP, I'm general public. I'm also <laughs> a cancer survivor. But more importantly, I want to learn because I want to try and teach people that integrative medicine is can be cured with good food. And you go back in history, and it, what is it saying? Let medicine be thy food, let food be thy medicine. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Hippocrates, yeah. Yes, and we sometimes forget about that. Mm. And we've been programmed. If you take an average, if you ask people to write down on average what they consume every day, you will soon see a massive pattern of sugar, insulin going into your gut, and you're wondering why you're having poor sleep, poor hygiene, why your skin's not good. And we forget that one of the most important parts of nutrition is protein. Mm. And pro the best protein is through animals. And that has been completely forgotten. We go to war over how many carbs and how much fat we should eat, which are both just energy sources for the body. And we completely ignore the building blocks for the body, which is the protein. And then, of course, we have this, you know, recent vilifying of animal proteins and all this encouragement of plant-based diets, which the more I study and the more people I talk to, the less convinced I am about the value of, of plants in our diets, to be perfectly honest. I'm not saying we shouldn't eat plants, but they're certainly not providing the nutrients that humans need for proper health. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, one of the things that, and I, I, I've been, you know, I've changed my paradigm. I thought it was, you know, six veggies a day kind of stuff. Yeah. And the yeah. more veggies you have, it will mean the more fiber you have, the more times you go to the toilet, therefore you'll feel better. But really what's this stuff doing to you? And about a year ago, I, sorry, two years ago, I went on to, I followed a keto diet. However, I was at that time, and I make no shame about this. I was probably drinking too much alcohol at the time as well. So you, alcohol has a massive amount of sugar. And, you know, I've taken this quest and I've been quite vocal about it. I turned 50 at the end of last year. 
and a gift to myself is to try and have no alcohol for a year. So I've done two months, and I have to say, congratulations! Thank you. It was weird because about August September time last year, every a lot of people come into my vortex. I've been sober for four four years, five years. I've got a brother who hasn't touched alcohol for twenty over twenty years. Mm. Mind you, he is an accountant, so um, <laughs> maybe he should. However, um, it doesn't mean that I'm never going to drink alcohol again. Right? Mm. I do like a glass of wine. I also in winter in the right environment a brandy or a whiskey is beautiful yeah. and for medicinal reasons it's fantastic in fact when i was going through chemotherapy my hematologist um said to me martin the night before chemotherapy have a glass of two of red wine but make sure it's pinot because pinot noir has got more antioxidants in it i tried to put a year full of red wine through as a medical expense in my tax <laughs> account. But my accountant, unless I got a script from my hematologist, she said it's not going to <laughs> Nice. I think I should change accountants from now on. Nice try. <laughs> so, you know, I've so I've taken this, this quest. I also, um, with a really good friend of mine who is a mutual friend of ours, um, Natalie West, she went carnivore about a year ago and we were just talking about it. I'm going, oh, I think I'll go keto. Most of my diet is keto. And she's like, come on, princess. You know, <laughs> it sounds like it doesn't go back. She's like, come on, princess. And I'm like, you know that person that you kind of revalue your friendship with? And you're going, mm -hmm. stop calling me princess. She's going, toughen up, go carnivore. Mm -hmm. So I went carnivore. And the beautiful thing is, I mentioned, and you were kind enough to give me that space to talk about my health journey. I am now eight years cancer free and I feel very blessed on that. Um, as a man, I get medically checked up now every four months, not every three months, every four months. So I have eight years of blood tests. So one thing that I would suggest to anybody, if they are going to change their nutrition, I don't want to hear the word diet because the first three letters die and it don't work. Health, first four letters heal so you're healing yourself and it's a lifestyle it's not a diet diet will activate hormones so it will make it not work do yourself a favor and go and get some blood tests beforehand if you are really serious about going down this pathway because they are a good marker and it also means even if you've got a functional doctor or an integrative medical practitioner You've got a marker that can actually help to, to help you to see and guide you because yeah. certain things might be useful for you. If you're changing your diet in your, in your 40s and 50s, it might be a slower process that you have to allow for that yeah. change to happen. Don't automatically think that you can flip the switch like flipping over a TV channel. Be patient. And you may have to review certain things that might not work for you because I'm not saying the damage, your body has taken all of those carbs, all of those things. So be patient and be kind to yourself. Yeah. And also allow the fact that nutrition is one of the pillars. Sleep, connectivity with other people. And I think if you are going to change, a, change to another healthy lifestyle, do it with a bunch of mates. Do it with your partner. Do it with your children. If you've got grown up children, do it with a circle of people. Makes it easier. And educate yourself with educated people, not with mm -hmm. Dr. Google. And I think the other really, key is really good advice. Have mm. a laugh about it. And mm. you know what? Like the other night, about two, three weeks ago, I felt like a glass of wine. It was a Friday night and I'm going, oh God, I've been working really hard. I feel like a glass of wine. So, and it's not about replacing, but I thought I'm going to do something different. I went to the supermarket and I bought some ice cream and I had some ice cream and it was <laughs> bloody delicious. Right. So, you know what? I am not snow wine, but I didn't want to go back. I've, I've got this quest and again, I've got that stoic Scottishism as me going, yeah. I'm going to do a year. I want to do a year. 
And when you tell people, it becomes alive. Mm. And the, the, the other thing, so since middle of December to last week, I've gone from 84 kilos, which in pounds, if we're doing it in pounds, is about 185 pounds to 72 kilos, which is 160 pounds in three months. Wow. Which is, is that just from the alcohol? Well, that's from alcohol, being carnivore, yeah cutting out sugar i'm sleeping better i've also yeah. been training so i've just um come off a 14 week um cycle of ocean swimming oh yes so i just completed a 1k ocean swim and i i run regularly so i run about 30 to 40k a week um but i'm also the most important is I'm reviewing some things that work and some things that don't work. And I'm going to have a big call out here. When, when you go from a lifestyle to carnivore or even keto, be prepared for some bowel movements that you might not want to talk about <laughs> with your friends, but you have to. Because it's just part and parcel. You're changing your biggest brain, which is your gut your mental cognitive thought process i know myself has improved dramatically mm -hmm. i feel more alive i've got more energy and i also feel that if you protect your gut your thought process is getting better and there's a there's a simple really important thing between your brain and your gut it's called your heart and I feel that you're beginning to give more love to your heart on a daily basis because you're nurturing your whole body. My skin's better. I feel better. I've noticed things like my nails are better. Mm. And well, you're I, getting more. You're getting. You're getting more nutrients into you. Yeah, and I don't have the sugar rush. And you know what? Again, you know. I was chatting to Natalie and she's got a 10 year old daughter and she goes, well, she had chocolate the other day. And it was like, oh, I just fancy some, have some. Don't be so, and this is where I would say that diet would have that bit going, no, I can't mm. have it. Yeah. You know what? Just have it. Just, mm. if you want, you know, as we're approaching, we're a month, we're four weeks away from Easter. If someone buys you an Easter egg, have a small amount of it. Someone's put that thought into it have it right don't try and be purer than snow white it's not going to work for you no i i agree and i think just being too regimented is, is as bad as not having any discipline whatsoever and it's, it's funny you mentioned there about plant-based people and you know i know of a lot of very passionate vegans and very passionate vegetarians and Gee, they're bloody quick. They're a bit like marathon runners, and I'm a marathon runner. We're bloody quick at telling you that, you, that you're a marathon runner. They're bloody quick at telling you that you're vegan or vegetarian. But then when you tap away at the surface and go deeper, the amount of supplements that they take in their cupboards that mm. they don't actually talk about is huge. Yeah. yeah. And again, Natalie and I have this crazy thing. We'll go to the to certain supermarkets or we'll go to fruit shops just you've also i think your eyesight becomes better when you've got more protein in you you see things clearer and this litany of healthy options help most of the healthy options we picked up over the last month two months have an emulsifier called canola oil which yeah. is banned in the u.s that's almost like putting diesel fuel down your throat on a daily basis. Why would you do that? Um, the biggest misnomer, though, I have to say is breakfast cereals. And again, you and I were probably brought up in the aspect of having cereal is the most important meal of the day. Yeah. What happens if we gave our kids meat for breakfast how well do you think they would do at school they wouldn't have that three o'clock rush but you know what sometimes you might not feel like it and again one of the key things when you're changing your health to a healthy lifestyle 
with having a group of people around you, you can balance what works for you, what time you want to eat, your emotions. Mm -hmm. So again, one of the things that uh, we've been doing is we've been doing intermittent fasting and the longest fast we've had is 46 hours. And then we did another one for 40 hours. And we both, Natalie's in Melbourne, I'm here in Sydney. We both felt very emotional after it. It tapped mm. into something. And again, as, as someone who's very passionate about your own wellness, and because your spiritual wealth, you can't put a number on it. You can't put a monetary aspect on it. If you get that right, and it's an evolving evolution on a daily basis, if that makes sense, um, it's actually okay to feel emotional. Like last mm -hmm. night, I was in bed at 8.30, right? And I'm going, I'm 50, I'm in bed at 30. What the hell am I doing? And then I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning, and you know what I was doing? I was ironing at 5 o'clock. My, my, my mother would have been so proud of me. <laughs> Um, and I think you have a different outlook in life. Um, you see, I mean, a lot of people, and one of the things that I found quite shy, I'm, 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 I'm an extrovert introvert. But over the last two, three months, so we're really since the turn of the year, people have been giving me a lot of compliments about how I look. And I've been quite shy about it because I'm not, I've never really had them before. <laughs> Even this morning, I was out running with my, one of my mates and he's going, you look really fit. I don't like you anymore. I was like, thanks. No, we're supposed to be mates. Yeah. But I uh, think one of the key things, and you know, being an optimist also means that you can have flat days. And food, sometimes you might not, you know, I've taken some plant-based, hey, sorry, some animal products and they haven't really worked for me mm -hmm. but I've also it's funny one of the things that we're, we're now doing is we're looking at different cuts of meat so I had ox heart the other night yeah and it was delicious absolutely delicious and I've got a slow cooker well I did have a wife at one point but I traded that in for a slow cooker <laughs> so I think I got the better option Sorry, can we edit that out? <laughs> but the slow cooker allows, when you're cooking meat, and I guess this is one of the other beautiful things, when you're cooking things like oxtail, which people would look at, it's delicious, and the bone marrow is beautiful, mm. but you get this bone broth the next day. Mm. And that is so good for your skin that people don't realise. And yet you go to some high street shops and they're selling that for ten dollars for half a kilo for mm -hmm. five hundred five hundred grams but you've just made it yeah and, it's and i think people love. people have really lost touch with cooking and preparing our food and because everything comes in a packet and it's already made and it's quick and it's easy and it's covered with marketing saying high fiber, get all your B vitamins. And even though you and I know that they're all just added in ones, they're all synthetic ones, people believe that you can get all your vitamins and nutrients and vitamin C and fiber from these packaged foods that, as you say, are full of emulsifiers, seed oils, added sugar, no real nutritional value whatsoever. And we have just adopted that as a lifestyle and people are really reluctant to give it up and it's funny because people say to you you know i'm sure you've found it and people say but what can i have for breakfast mm. simple thing eggs and again which is big in the keto world avocado mm. right so eggs and avocado for breakfast is a beautiful and to me, I've, as I said, I've got two teenage daughters. I know the elder one. She loves that for breakfast, mm -hmm. right? So for a 14-year-old youth, be it male or female, that will set them up really well for the day. Yeah. So if they don't want to take meat and they're still hesitant about it, don't force... I was going to say, don't force your kids, but you will be the catalyst for change. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And we're never too old to change. And as I said, some things I know, for example, um, there's I've tried to cook liver a few times and it's not worked for me. It's not, it's, it's just, maybe maybe I've been scarred from my childhood or something, I don't know. But it's not, it's not working for me. And I'm going, park it, use some, you do some other things. And it, the liver is so good for you, but if it's not working for you, yeah, don't, don't, sweat. don't stress it. I, I grew up eating liver. Um, I was, we had venison. So my dad was a hunter and provided most of our food, you know, with venison. So we had a lot of liver. And my mum had, I quite liked the way my mum cooked liver. So that was good. But these days, I just get the butcher to mince up my liver into some ground beef. And it's an easy, easy way to eat it. And it actually makes the beef a little bit more, gives it a little bit more guts and flavour to the beef. Well, it's, 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 it's a simple thing. You know, one of, one of the, um, I see a, a, a pattern of food traits, you know, taco Tuesday. Here we are Tuesday, right? A lot of families do tacos as a, as a meal. Mm. However, if you go to the supermarket and they buy off the shelf packaged taco shelves, they're full of preservatives and full of crap, to put it mildly. And vegetable oils, which oh. are just, you know, and, you know, we're talking about cancer and things like that. Um, so my aspect is buy a nice lettuce and use the lettuce leaves as a taco yeah. shell and put that in. Yeah. And lo and behold, you're getting, you know, you're getting, if you've washed it well enough, you're getting good ingredients out of a nice wholesome lettuce, which cost-wise is next to nothing. One thing I have noticed, and this has been really astonishing, I have no food wastage at home now mm. that I am carnivore. Yeah, yeah, really does eliminate wastage. Right, um, doesn't mean that, you know, one of the loves that I have in winter, I love a big bowl of wholehearted chicken soup. And there's medicinal reasons why chicken soup can be good for you. You know what, if I feel like it in winter, I'll make the damn thing. But right now it's not winter. So I don't, mm. it's not in my vortex. Mm. However, the big thing that I've saved and the more economical, I go into the fridge, there's no wastage. Um, and we haven't even touched on the milk aspect in this country. <laughs> and we could go on for hours talking about dairy, I guess. <laughs> but my call out to people is, Get a support group around you and try it. And also, there are so many great applications now that you can download. Try once a week intermittent fasting. You know, give it a go. But mm. stick with it for a few months. Um, I mentioned Natalie and I, and we can work out when it's good for us. And every two weeks, we've seen that there's a pattern that we can do it. Because yeah. we know we can put our work capacity, we can balance things out yep. and we'll do a 40 hour or 40 hour plus. Part of us wants to try a little bit longer, but let's do it in baby steps. Let's do yeah. 40 and then 48. And if, if it's 48, you're kind of going, well, I'm going to go to bed in two hours, so I'm not going to eat, I'll just go to bed. Mm -hmm. and behold, you pushed it out to maybe 60 hours and your body feels fantastic after it. But I think even for beginners, you know, for people just listening to this who this is maybe a bit scary or all new stuff, I think there's a few concepts that come out of this and that is, you know, even start with 14 or 16 hours. Yeah. You know, and then make sure you eat your protein because if you eat your protein, then you that helps to spell those cravings that you have for all those carbohydrates and those other foods, because if we don't get enough protein, and I was just talk, talking to Dr. Pran Yoganathan about that this morning, the protein leverage theory. If we don't get enough protein, our body is screaming out, sending all these hunger hormones and all these other um, chemicals out telling us to eat and eat. And then we keep filling ourselves up with these breakfast cereals or these muffins or these scones. Wholeheartedly, and you make a really good point. You know, if 
even just once a week, you, you decide not to have breakfast and you have lunch around any time between 11.30 and 1.30. Make sure it's good quality protein, even going as far as to say, have a steak, have mm. some good meat mm. for you then, because then you will not have those cravings later on. There's also good fish. You know, we talk, we, we talk mostly of, in, in the carnivore world, we talk mostly on meat. There's also some good fish, but I would say one of the challenges here, and I don't know what it's like in New Zealand, is a lot of the quality of fish products here is pretty poor. Yeah, and it's quite expensive here as well. Yeah, if you want to go for real stuff, it's mm -hmm. pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, meat is not that expensive. And one thing I have to say, I think New Zealand has got it, is very much like Scotland, where you have an abundance of good quality meats at also reasonable prices. Mm. People complain about the price, but if you're complaining about a packet of mints compared with a packet of instant noodles, well then of course, oh. you know, but you know, if you look at a, a, a kilo of steak costs 12 or $15, or, you know, if you buy fattier steak, which is even healthier, it probably costs less. And how much, you know, how many members of the family can you feed for that at, you know, there's four or five dollars a head for a bunch of people for a meal. Um, and then you can add in a few veggies or, or whatever else you well, want. Well, it's also, you know, even the simple things like eggs. You know, eggs in the UK in the 90s, 80s and 90s got really bad rap. But mm. eggs are so good because they've got mm. such good fats in them. Mm. And it's funny, you, you know, I, I mentioned there that I'm lucky I get regularly blood tests. I, a really strange thing, and I guess one of the beautiful things is that over the last few years of my circle of people around me, I've been really amazing medics. I've been, I'm feeling very blessed to be on the board of a medical college, evangelizing some of the forward thinking medical thoughts. For example, my mind has shifted, and we spoke about this last week, Medicinal cannabis and medicinal mushrooms have mm -hmm. a place in society. Well, I was maybe five, six years ago, very much against them. But the more I've educated and the more I've seen the evidence, there is a real need for them to become mainstream, especially cannabis has got a real global momentum that is, is worthwhile. However, what, what has been really good is so I went and got a blood test by my GP and they called me and said, your, your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, for those who are unaware, you've got two, you've got HDL and LDL, your, blood, your bad cholesterol is a little bit on the high side, Martin. I said, oh, look, I'm seeing my hematologist. Um, I'm sure if it's a challenge, then he'll mention it to me. But he is aware that I have changed to carnivore. Went in to see him and he went, I don't care about it. You look fantastic. And even he said to me, you disappoint me, Martin. I, I love seeing you because I call you fatty most of the time. <laughs> and now you've lost so much weight. I don't know what to call you. <laughs> so, you know, you learned 10 hours of nutrition at university. Did you learn any manners in all that time when you were studying? <laughs> so I guess one of the other key things, call outs, I mentioned there about having a team of people and getting the right advice. As a human being, we have the right to shop around for the right medical practitioner as well. And, and it's I love hearing you say that. And I hope people listening to this take that on board because, you know, as you probably know, analyzing blood tests from a nutritional perspective, not a di disease diagnostic perspective, but you know, from an optimal well-being perspective is one of the things that I've learned to do over the last 10 years. And the pushback you get from GPs about doing that, um, nobody, they don't understand the relationships between the different markers. They don't understand how they can tell people about their overall health. And they, they are very, very discouraging to clients who are looking to optimize their health um, and 
yeah, I forgot what your first comment was about that, but you can you can you can shop, you can shop around for yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, so not so much. You don't want a yes person. You want the most important. It's like having a marriage or a friendship. If you want the best out of a medical practitioner, you've got to give them all the information that's happening in your psychological, your emotional, your financial, all pillars of your life to get the best out of that medical practitioner. It might be overkill, but there might be one thing that you've said that will trigger them to go, let's get a test on this, let's look at this, let's look at that. They are trained to listen, and some of them are very, very good, I have to say. Some of them are still the six-minute medicine practitioners, mm. which give medicine a bad name. If, if that's what you want out of your medical practitioner, then that's fine. If that's all you think is important. But if you're really serious about your health, you know, when I changed GPs recently, the beautiful thing that the GP said to me, what do you, what part of, of your team do you want me to play in it? And I thought that that was really cool because she understood excellent. Mm. my mm. complexities. My hematologist is really my medical captain, if that makes sense. Mm. And when I tell him some of the things that I'm doing, one, he's supportive, but he's also cautious. I'll give you an example. Um, three, six months ago, I got my vitamin D done. And I said, oh, it was only about 90. And I said, oh, shouldn't it be about 120? And he said, Martin, you have to be careful because you've had a blood cancer. If you have too much vitamin D, it can have an impact on your calcium levels. So I didn't know this. So years ago, I would have gone quite defensive. I went out and went, wow, I've learned something. Well, I mean, one of the things that one of the things I always test with vitamin D is parathyroid hormone. Yep. Because, you know, because of that interrelationship between the two of them, and somebody might think that their vitamin D level is good, but if their parathyroid ho hormone is high, well, then it's probably not good. And if it's, and someone else might think their vitamin D is low, and yet their parathyroid hormone is perfect. So, you know, it's such an individual marker that depends on that actual person. Oh, wholeheartedly. And, you know, I think one of the key things is that, you know, I mentioned there that your health journey is not a quick fix. This is not triage that we go into mm. accident and emergency. Mm. And dare I say, here we are in March now. How many people do we know that made a new year resolution? I want to eat healthy. Yeah. One, it's never too late to start. But two, do it properly. Don't just think uh, if you eat salad every day, you're going to lose weight. That's well, you, not do, you, you, you start off losing weight and you feel excited, but you can't keep it up for very long. And the metabolic consequences are enormous and you end up being fatter than you were when you started. And then, and then you, we get into the realm of where our friend Natalie works with the psychological psychotherapy aspects where your whole trust in yourself, your belief in yourself um, just falls to pieces with this yo-yo dieting cycle. Well, it's, it's funny. I mean, I'm, I'm coaching a couple of um, female clients and they're similar age to me. So they're going through menopause. And then when you talk to them and you go, were you on the contraceptive pill when you were younger? And you kind of go, I've known you for 30 years. I know you were on the pill, mm -hmm. right? And they go, well, you, go, you were, right? Just don't bullshit me. You were. The amount of copper that's in the pill and, and prescriptive HRT medication has an impact on women's health that medics don't like talking about. Mm. So when I've, when I've said this to some of my female um, friends and people I'm coaching, they go, but you're a bloke. How do you know this stuff? I'm going... I'm not being sexist, but this is this stuff is quite, you know, almost like one-on-one stuff when you start working with some medics, etc. And I've got some mates in Switzerland, for example, where it's home of, you know, the top, at least the top 10 pharmaceutical organizations in the world. 
their mindset is HRT medication is a way forward. Mm. When you put, and the, the sad thing though that I have found, and I think Natalie mentioned it to me anyway as well, and I know that you'll agree with this, it also takes a bit, very brave medical practitioner, regardless of what type of practitioner you are, whether it be medical, dietetics, nutrition, to put your hand up and say, we've got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Once they start doing this, and I'm working with two universities just now, um, psychology and psychiatry department of two of them, global organizations, and they've reached out to me about the, the work I'm doing with men going, we want to work with you, Martin. And I'm going, thankfully, because they've said to me, we're getting some things wrong. How many psychologists ask in the first meeting when they meet a client, talk to me about your nutrition? I would say less than 5% really give a monkeys about the nutrition of the clients. And that's a sad, sad thing. Nutrition, you eat with your eyes, your emotions, your feelings. Um, I coached this one girl and she wrote down three days of what she was eating. So we made a couple of little changes and lo and behold, she lost five kilos in a week. Mm. And she felt so much better. And you know what? Again, especially if you've got teenagers, right? I guess teenagers are that kind of quirky We've all been teenagers at some point in time. You know what? If you want to have popcorn and chips or crisps, whatever you want to call them, every couple of weeks watching a movie, just do it, mm. right? It's not so much a cheat day. I don't want to say it's cheap, but life is too short not to enjoy it. I'm all for if 90, if, if you were to put a percentage on it, if between 80 and 90% of the stuff that you're consuming is of health value, yeah, then absolutely. it's okay. Yeah, enjoy the rest of it. Absolutely. You know, I totally, I totally agree. agree. Yeah. You know, I've I've actually taken myself, so I've been an experiment to myself. I've gone to the fast food outlets. I don't want to name them. I've gone to them to taste what it's like. I've made a choice. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. Right? However, you can go to a fast food outlet and go, can I have a hamburger, but without the bread, please? Can I just have the burger? Can I just have the, the meat? You meat and the lettuce. To make that decision. And, mm. you know, you don't want to be a social outcast. A lot of people think that when you go on this, you become, you know, an outcast or you can't do anything. It takes five minutes. I was out at dinner with a group of friends the other week. And I knew where I was going. So I had a look at the menu beforehand. And my Scottishism was getting into me. Susan, I thought, I'm not paying $38 for a 200 gram steak. <laughs> no way. Not when I know I can go and get three, uh, four or five of them at least for that price. So you make a choice and you go, you know what? I'll have this instead. Mm. Um, there's, there's so many other things that you can do. And um, you don't miss out um and it's funny because i was dealing again you know looking at different medical practitioners i've gotten i've got friendly with a clinical uh, nutritionist and she came to me and for some reason a lot of people who have gone through cancer come to me but she came to me and said i've got a patient and he's really struggling with his self image and his, his self-awareness and he keeps putting on weight. I said, well, talk to him about the love that he has for himself, not for others. You know, so his relationship with food is probably not fantastic. So shift the conversation to himself. I'm also dealing with a, a mate that I know who is an extremely smart man. He's the same age as me. And this is his second round of... Um, cancer that he's had and he's gone through a stem cell transplant but he spent nine weeks in hospital because his body rejected it initially he's 105 kilos oh. 
and he's got two young kids. His kids are, I think, eight and ten. And I remember saying to him five, six years ago, I'm not asking you to do much, but I'm asking you to walk. He, he worked in the city centre here in Sydney and lived on the other side of the Harbour Bridge, about 10 kilometres north of the Harbour Bridge. I said, I'm asking you just to walk over the Harbour Bridge three times a night, three times a week. Take your suit off and walk over. The excuses that he had was almost like the excuses a child has about not handing in homework. Mm, yeah, I know. I hear them all. And part of me, I want to go to his house because I know him and his wife well now. I want to go to his house and just be really tough and go through his cupboards and go, this is going out, this is going out. But you also have to allow others to come on this journey when they are right to come on this journey. Yeah. And again, going back to the, the difference I feel being carnivore, keto, than that of vegan and vegetarian, we're very, I would say that the camp of carnivore and keto are also very respectful for other people's choices and what they think is right. Mm. I have not felt myself throwing it down people's throats. You must do this. You must do that. Do you realize this is the lifestyle I am I'm choosing that's working for me? If that's working for you being a vegetarian or a vegan, then that's great. But just be mindful that you are missing out on really essential vitamins and minerals. Mm, absolutely. Essential nutrients. You know, and... You know, I'm not saying that let's do a bake off whose skin's better, yeah. whose health is better. That's egocentric. But let's look at some blood tests. That will tell you the truth. I, I totally agree with you about that. And I, I think mean, blood tests are a great way to set that starting place and then see where you see where you're going and looking at all your inflammation markers and things like that is a really great way to see whether the diet is suiting you. And one of the problems with blood tests is a lot of people, their LDL or their total cholesterol might go up a little bit when they start eating more animal fats and animal meats. And then their doctors say, well, it's fantastic. Your diabetes has gone away and you've lost 15 kgs and you're sleeping better and your brain fog's fixed. And you're feeling really well, but I don't like this cholesterol. So, and you know, let's go back to eating that crappy diet you were eating before. And again, that's a real lack of understanding about cholesterol metabolism as well. Um, well, it's, it's funny. I think one of the one of you know we spoke about marketing there, and in all fairness, um, I think it was maybe about ten years ago when paleo started getting a bit of momentum in the marketplace. And I actually think it had some good things in it, but it's been around since the seventies for God's sake. Mm, mm. And, you know, one of the key things that I think it's that where the medical profession have to put on their adult pants, if that makes sense, is they have to learn a little bit more about nutrition. Mm. And well, I mean, one of, one of the biggest things, not just about nutrition, that here in Australia, where um, a big challenge is on the environmental side, was actually the houses that people live in with the amount of dampness that's in the house. Mm -hmm. Therefore, asthmat asthmatic. Mm -hmm. And they don't put two and two together. Um, the other big one where I didn't know about, and again, I've got a circle of um, people that I know who are lactation consultants and very much into that space of helping women, especially new mums, where I know her, when I, I became a father, my ex-wife, we struggled the first couple of months with breastfeeding, but they come and they help out. But they also forget that it's what the woman eats as well. Mm, those, yeah. those few months are critically important for the mother's health. Mm. And if a guy wants to be supportive, support the woman as well. Mm. Right? Um, so, guys, we have, you know, the call out for me as a, as a man is we've got some education we have to do, some fundamental education that we have to have. 
right, which is incredibly basic stuff. But I would like to see, for example, meditation being part of a school curriculum, the same as freaking maths and arithmetic and, you know, learn how to meditate on a daily basis. And I was asked recently on a podcast what advice I would give my 18-year-old self. And I'm proud of my journey that I've been on, but I wish I learned how to meditate when I was 18, not Do just wanted- here. Do you want to talk briefly about the benefits of meditation? Because I think that we don't really understand what meditation does. And I think, you know, to me, meditation is how you learn to take control of your thoughts. And, and you know, throughout the day, we have all these thoughts and feelings coming at us all the time, and we believe them. And meditation teaches you how to stop and kind of block those off i'll let you i'll let you talk about the benefits so there's the beautiful thing again if we use technology right because we now become codependent in many ways our biggest i was going to say the 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 biggest relationship we have as grown-ups is not with our significant partners probably with your phone (laughs) yeah right and You know, if we take a lot of the streaming um, technologies that you can get, and there's there's so many that you can get, and they're they're pretty reasonable and price-wise, there are so many good applications for mindfulness. And I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll take you into my kind of world a little bit. I will meditate between 10 and 20 minutes most mornings. And I'm lucky the setup that I've now created for myself When we wake up in the morning, we all inevitably need to go for a call of nature. That's part and parcel of being a human being. However, I do not leave my bedroom until I've meditated for that 10 or 20 minutes. I don't want to take on, even if I'm going running or doing sport in the morning, I will get up half an hour earlier, I wake half an hour earlier to meditate. Be grateful for the breath that I have and one of the key things that I've learned about meditation, we always talk about in mindful living, if that makes sense, we talk about letting, letting go. When we actually let go of our breath that no longer has served us for that day, it's really a metaphor for so many things in our life. But we're programmed in our thinking, and this is where meditation actually really works We're programmed in our thinking. Meditation helps us change that program thinking. We're programmed to to inhale. But when we should actually be exhaling more than we inhale. And when we get rid of that air that has served us, again, it creates this thing in our cellular body. And it's this movement that's really gathering momentum And for those who are not aware of it, it's a thing called epigenetics. And I know you and I have spoken about it, but epigenetics really is the movement of life energy. And that can be mindfulness, but also you don't have to always meditate. As a parent, what is one of the things that you can do to annoy your grandchildren or your teenagers? Parent dance when you're making dinner. It will cheese them off. They'll get embarrassed. You'll crack yourself up laughter. You'll connect with your kids because they'll go, you're an idiot. But your whole body, and that also is a form of meditation, if that makes sense, Mm. right? You don't always have to be in this Zen moment of meditating and peacefulness. That's one way. The other way is involving other ones. And I'm also a big fan of Wim Hof. For those who don't know about the Wim Hof methodology, might be more familiar with the ice baths. Yeah. Now, I went last year with a mate of mine to the Snowy Mountains. Oh, excuse me. And we actually went into the water. It was minus six. We hiked in speedos in minus four (laughs) for four hours in the snow. It was incredible. 
And when you put your mind to it, your mind can do many, many things. And the one key thing I took from that is that you could put your mind to anything else. So I now have once a week a cold shower. So again, another call out about mindfulness and a bit of fun you can have with you within your, your family environment, not only changing your healthy eating, if you've got a family environment, have a, have a day that you choose to have a cold shower. Everybody in the household has a cold shower that day. And maybe have a sheet on the fridge, how name and how you felt about having the cold shower. And see over a few weeks how everybody feels about it. One, it's a bit of fun. And two, again, being Scottish, it will save you bloody money on the healing bill. Oh, I love it. I love it. Gosh, we've been talking for ages. There is one little story I would like you to tell because we haven't covered that off today. And I think it's a really great little story. And that is about when you went to see the psychologist. We started talking about you seeing the psychologist in the beginning. And you talk about your happy psychologist with his long hair and his jeans and oh. the advice he gave you. So... Um, as I mentioned, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to see quite a few psychologists and some have been really good and some have been not so good. Again, you make that choice. But I was in a really dark space and almost, you know, for those who have done a bit of psychology, I was in that victim mentality. I couldn't see the light and I couldn't see joy in a lot of the things that I was doing and I was really struggling and struggling um, I would put the mask on going to work but I was struggling internally and I went to I got advised I got suggested to go and see this psychologist in a in a resort area called Manly which is you know world famous beach nearby beautiful part of Sydney I think it was the third third time I'd gone to see him and he was very old school so he had the ponytail, kind of beard, training shoes, jeans on. And I was very, dare I say it, very British. So I would have a nice pair of pants on and a shirt on. Because that's how I thought you wore, what you wore when you'd see, you know, a medic. And he, he went through a few things with me, third time there. And then he went, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? And I'm going, yeah. And I, I really couldn't see where he was going. This is really, you know, it was 30 degrees or whatever. And he said, do you have your sports gear with you, like running shoes or your swimmers? I mean, we're right next to the beach. So I was like, oh, God, yeah, I mean, I'm coming to Manly. I'm, you, I always carry my sports gear in the car with me. It's just almost like brushing your teeth. He said, right, okay, that's great. And just that, you know, that awkward silence that you have, you kind of go, oh, God, what's going to happen next? He said, listen. You're a young man. You're a beautiful young man. I'm like, where are we going with this? I said, fuck off out my office. Get into the ocean. Get your swimmers on and get on with your life and stop feeling sorry for yourself. And it was that tough love that I needed that was so important. It was another pivotal part of my wellness journey I had to go into the gutter to come out of it if that makes sense mm. and it was that kick in the backside that I really needed and there's actually a, a further on story to that that I didn't share with you when we spoke the last time so a few months later I'm in the hospital in Sydney getting my usual three-month checkup and I'm sitting waiting for my hematologist and who walks out of my hematologist's office? But that psychologist. He'd been diagnosed with a blood disorder. And oh. he knew who my he knew who my hematologist was. And he knew that he was pretty good. So he called him up and said, Listen, you're seeing one of my patients. I need to see you. And what was really kind was you've got a really good psychologist reaching out to another professional person and that professional person saying yes i'll see you but then the psychologist came out of the office and he waited for me in the in the foyer area downstairs and he said you're the teacher now martin i'm your pupil 
Oh, how wonderful. And it was just a beautiful mm -hmm. way of sort of going, I need your help. I know that if I need something, you can help me see right. through this. And I caught, I bumped into him a few months later and he was looking fantastic. But the irony of it, again, seeing him in the hospital, but getting that kick up the backside, we sometimes have to have, and sometimes it might take a stranger to do that for us. So mm -hmm. again, a call out, we see doctors, we see nutritionists, it should never be anything but pride if you go and see a psychologist. Most professional athletes or most professional business people now have, they'll call it a coach, mm. right? I coach mm. people for a living. I also have a couple of coaches that I reach out to for help. Mm. You cannot do things isolated on your own. No, and isn't that the truth? Humans are a social animal and we absolutely need that social connection. Oh, and... You know, it, it's funny because, again, that, that's probably a good circle to end this. One of the great strengths about the men's circle I had was bringing that connection, that physical connection, because I can't do it online. It's got to be something physical because, again, going to that primitive man, we need to feel the presence of someone else. Mm -hmm. And the power, and again, just to leave you with this one, I, again, is, now that we've gone into this new world, don't forget the basic humanity of the power of a hug. Giving someone a hug is incredible. And it costs nothing. Mm. No, and it's it's a sign of friendship, respect. Um, you know, for men, it's giving them a handshake as well, yeah. is really important. But there's something beautiful about hugging someone. I'm a hugger, and I have to say that last year I found it sometimes quite difficult. Um, yeah. But giving someone a hug is your appreciation and their appreciation of you, which is really critical. Mm. Well, that's a beautiful place to end it. Thank you. Hey, that's thank fantastic. you. I Can really I enjoyed it, Susan. Can I please get some details from you? Um, so if you want to tell everyone where they can find you, and I'm going to write those down um, because I know I've got you on LinkedIn and yep. various places, but I'll just make sure I get so those on, accurately. Yep, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook as my name, Martin Gillespie. I also have um, my personal email address is martin at gemwellnesswarrior.com.au. Um, um, how do you spell that? J A G for Gillespie, E for Edward, oh, yeah. for Martin. Oh, yeah. So Gem Wellness Warrior. Oh, yeah, Gem Wellness. Yep. Um, I will have a website up and running. I did have it, but I wasn't comfortable with it. You know, sometimes when you put something together. Yeah. And so I just interrupt. What was uh, Martin at Gem Wellness Warrior? What's the rest dot com dot au. Dot com. Oops. Dot. Oh, Are you? Thanks. Yep. Okay, carry on. And I'm on Instagram um, yeah. of Martin M. Gillespie 70. Um, I'm on that. And uh, I probably share, I like to share some things, especially on social media. Again, going back to the fact that you are in control of your own content. There is some personal stuff I will put there and I'm, I'm happy to put personal stuff up. Um, and yeah, that's probably the best way. Or, you know, my contact details are on LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn yep. extensively. I find that yep. is, a, is a really good tool. Great. And do you do online coaching at all with people? Um, not at the moment, because I feel that um, I'm getting a lot of traction on the human element of face-to-face. Right. Yeah. And especially here in the Sydney market where face-to-face, -face, I've got some good coaching happening face-to-face, -face, my group sessions, and I'm just tapping into the executive market here. Um, online, it will be something that if the demands are there, I will do. But I feel that the beauty of 
working with people is that that human connection mm. i mean mm. like if logistically you're in new zealand right there is no way at this moment in time i will offer online if that's what people are wanting so i don't want to say no to it i do have people in the uk that i am doing online stuff with um but bearing in mind the time difference on certain mm. things mm. i have to say that you have i to was just this. yeah i was just thinking particularly for men over here who may be facing um, serious health, health challenges like the, like your face or not, something like that. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an early riser, so I would be happy to do some online stuff. Um, if, that, if, that's a, if that's the best way forward, then I would happily do online coaching. Um, and bear in mind that you're allowing me into your private space if that makes sense and I'm allowing yeah. you into my private space mm. so you know if we are doing online you're going to be quite exposed and exposed in a nice way mm. and you can actually I think one of the things I've found with online you can cut through some of the BS quite quickly mm. Mm. which is which is kind of good um but well, I'm not people the, can, sorry I'm people can People can contact you privately yep. at, by emailing you, and yes. then you can yeah. You then know, I can then I can work out what and it's yeah. also what's going to work out best for them as well. I'm 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 mm. fully aware that I can I can work in different flexibilities if that mm. makes sense. Mm. Um, and also, the biggest call I, I would say for those who want to work with me be prepared to be a little bit uncomfortable because the more uncomfortable you are, the more you're going to get out of this. Mm. If you come with a preconceived idea or you just want me to blow smoke up your backside, I'm not going to be the right person for you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you're going to have to do some work on your own. Um, and a lot of people I've found, as I said, with people I've gone to, you go and then you don't see them for six weeks and you then you spend the first 20 minutes of your next meeting just catching up what you did six weeks ago mm -hmm. i would rather do here's a program that will work for you you have to commit to it yeah 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 so once you commit you're putting money where your mouth is but you're also committing to yourself emotionally financially and there may be times where you go, this is, I mean, I, I remember going to see a psychologist and I went, I'm not, I'm done. I can't see you today. I'm sorry. Can we reschedule? And most people, and I will be one of them, that once I get to know you, we can be more flexible as well. Mm. It's got to work mm. in with your, where you are psychologically and emotionally to get the best mm. out of working with me. Fair mm. comments. Hey, well, thank you so much again. I think Thanks, people Susan. will get a lot out of this, and I and I I hope we get a few men actually. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I, I look well. forward to bastardizing this all over social media together. Yeah, yeah let's do that. And Natalie and I are doing a um, a live Q and A in a couple of weeks, but. I'm sure there'll be something that perhaps the three of us could do together. Um, yeah, I could be Natalie's translator, actually. That would be fine. Um, you know, a Kiwi, a Scotsman and a Nozzy go together. You know, it sounds like some kind of joke. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm sure the, I, jokes, actually, the jokes will fly. <laughs> depending on timing-wise, I'm just sort of thinking, you know, as we're, as we're lucky enough to have gone into... You know, those who are parents having kids at school and we're into school mm -hmm. holidays... Easter it's a perfect time again it's a change of season to actually mm. maybe talk about certain things that are useful to boost your immune system like yeah. turmeric for example um fantastic even as a carnivore I will cook with turmeric because it's got good reasons behind it mm. right so using some traditional herbs and spices can actually help build your immune system and gives a different flavor how to cook things differently and you know again food is something to be enjoyed it is but i'll leave that i'll leave that to um you know 
the two the two women that I admire mm. and uh, will tell me what the hell I'm doing. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get you organised. Hey, thanks again, Martin. No problem, Susan. I'll speak to you soon.